So this one seems to be defective. Um, so uh, as per California state law, mandatory conflict of interest disclosure, anything good I say about any of these companies, take it with a grain of salt if it comes from me. Uh, but what I want to focus on is the, um, the idea of why, why we're building what we're building in Project Jupiter. And this is a quote that was on the door of one of my PhD advisors when I started in grad school. And I think if it was true in 1962, it's taken from a classic book in numerical analysis from the day. If this was true back uh, over 50 years ago, it's even more true now, given the amount of data and computing power that we have available to, to us. Um, I don't need to belabor the, in the, to this audience the point that wherever you look at, uh, we're drowning in data, right? That's why we're here. We're trying to make sense of it. We're trying to build tools for it. I'm a scientist, so a lot of the data that I worry about uh, is of, of a scientific nature, but the same questions arise in business. And it turns out that no matter how much data we have, we still only have one of these small blobs of meat inside of our heads. Uh, we have either old little computers or we have new big machines that are fancy and have lots of cores and GPUs and whatnot. And what Project Jupiter tries to do is basically build tools for that bridge, build tools to help you think, to help you extract insight, to help you understand what you're doing with still one limited brain. So everything we do is kind of about having humans in the loop, having humans playing with the data, playing with the tools, exploring ideas, typing at the keyboard, and trying to under make, sense, uh, make sense of the world. Um, the project and everything I'm talking about started uh, already a while ago. Back in 2001, I was a grad student, sort of procrastinating on a, on a PhD dissertation. Um, and I wanted to use open source tools for uh, kind of a combination of of, of technical interest in Python and ethical reasons for wanting to ha be able to collaborate uh, with my colleagues, uh, to be able to share the kind of work that I was doing with people back in Colombia, for example, where I come from, uh, without uh, having them be bound to proprietary licenses. And, uh, and IPython was born uh, at the beginning as a simple um, terminal client uh, to run Python interactively so that I could access the file system, I could run scripts, I could open plotting, uh, I, I can open plot windows and continue typing code. So it was basically sort of the everyday workflow of running code and computing. Um, and this is a screenshot of a slightly uh, newer version than the original one, which now has, has a few nicer things. But the basic idea is the same. But over 15 years, lots of people have, have done all the real work. And so I, I want to emphasize that everything I'm going to present today is really the work of other people. And all I do here is stand up and take credit for, for other people's work. There are a number of you uh, in this room. Uh, this is a, a picture from our uh, dev meeting last spring um, at LBL. And lots of people uh, who have also contributed out in the, uh, on GitHub. Uh, we have partnerships uh, with, uh, with uh, folks who support us, both funding agencies uh, and companies who work in partnership with the project. Everything we do is open source. Uh, and if it wasn't also for these partnerships and this support, we, we wouldn't be here. Um, and what I, what I want to focus on is, is how we build what, what we do, which is to try to give you building blocks. We, I'll try to illustrate with examples that what we're trying to do is build building blocks, not one big monolithic kind of precast Lego uh, toy, which uh, I don't particularly like, but rather the little old school ones that you can assemble and reassemble the way you like to solve the problems that you have. Um, and that began with actually looking at what we were doing at the terminal uh, in IPython and asking, well, this read eval print loop where I type, something happens, and I get an answer back, could we turn that into a network protocol? Could we abstract that away and reassemble it in other ways. And we did that, and we broke the idea of executing the code into what we call a kernel and taking input and output into what we call clients. And we wrote, we actually defined a protocol for, for that to go back and forth. And we said, if you implement this protocol, then anything can execute the code and anything can be the interface. And the first iteration of that idea was to have IPython now have a graphical interface that kind of looked like a terminal, but was actually a QT application, was a graphical console that could do multi-line editing, that could do syntax highlighting, that could do inline plots. This was back in 2010. Um, with the same idea as the year after, we wrote a new interface, which was instead of the, um, the Qt application was embedded in a web browser, it was called at the time the IPython notebook, now you know it as the Jupyter notebook, which would allow you not only to run code and math, but also to have text, to have math, to have marked, uh, markdown, uh, markdown that would be rendered live in the browser. So to first approximation, you can think of it as basically Google Docs with a brain, right? You have a document editor in the web browser, but it actually has computation built into it. Um, 
Now, I want to quickly uh, mention what, what the whole IPython Jupyter transition is about. Um, what simply happened was that we looked at what we were doing at these abstractions, at these building blocks that we had, and we, re we realized that a number of them were specific to Python, right? The IPython kernel, um, the IPython uh, uh, terminal client, um, some tools for parallel computing interactively in Python, but most of the rest could in principle, be used with any other programming language, right? These network protocols, these clients, all of these tools could really be precisely because they were defined through a protocol, they could have anything in the back end. So we simply took the IPython repository, which was a big monolith, spliced it in two, and the piece that was language agnostic, that became Project Jupyter, and we actually broke it into multiple smaller, uh, smaller individual tools. So that's all there is to it. IPython continues to exist, but now IPython is inside of the bigger umbrella Jupyter project. And so you can think that one way to put it is IPython kind of spawned its own parent, right? Because it spawned its own uh, uh, kind of uh, umbrella organization. Uh, and so with these protocols now, we can have, as I said, different kernels. So we have Python, which is, uh, uh, which is provided by the IPython kernel. But there's a Julia kernel out there that I think there's a talk about Julia uh, la later in the conference. There's an R kernel that I'll show in a minute. And there's kernels for many other languages. And last, at last count, we had about 75 different implementations of backends. And every single one of those works immediately with all the front ends. So everything that we're showing Jupyter-wise applies to all of these kernels automatically, because that's the point of having a protocol that you can reuse. There are also clients that can be built in other ways. I'm not going to steal their thunder, but later today, you're going to see a talk from Safi Abdallah about the Interact project, which provides, among other things, alternate desktop clients. So instead of being a web browser um, based client, it's a local desktop application. And you'll see more about that project later today. Um, the same team from Interact has developed uh, another tool that uses the same protocols, but now in a text editor. So this is Hydrogen, which is a component for the Atom editor. And what it does is even though you're in a text editor, it's communicating with the same kernel. And it's giving you, it allows you to basically get outputs from the text, embedded in the text editor. When you save, obviously, it's just a text file. But as you're working, if you want to be in a local text editor workflow, you can still connect that to an execution context. And if what you're interested in is more of a traditional sort of MATLAB IDE style workflow, because that may be the background you come from, the Spider project, uh, which is a Qt, a Qt desktop application, embeds an IPython, an IPython console uh, in, in it. And it actually uses that same Qt console that I was talking about. So this is just to illustrate how, by providing these pieces, they can be recomposed either by ourselves, which we obviously build our own tools, or by others in the community and in, the, in, our, in our ecosystem. And now, if you have those kernels and you say, well, I actually want to put them in some other infrastructure, we also provide tools uh, to help that kind of reassembly. So the Kernel Gateway Project allows you to actually expose kernels over HTTP in a, in a systematic fashion. So if you're not interested in using our servers, but you simply want to access, um, access those services, not through the notebook, but actually as a back end to other things, there is a, there is a system that precisely gives you kind of that, that, composition, um, that composition ability. The notebooks themselves uh, are, um, are structured files full of metadata. So I just want to illustrate a couple of things you can do with them. The, uh, for example, because notebooks are not just plain text files, they're actually a JSON data structure, you can embed rich metadata everywhere in them. And so this is an example of a project that uses that metadata to manage homework assignments so that the author of the assignments can tag with metadata what is a homework problem, how many points it should, um, it should be graded with, whether it should be automatically graded or graded by a human, et cetera. And then people, uh, it makes it much easier to manage large courses uh, with notebook-based content. Um, using the same idea, but a different type of metadata, uh, we've collaborated with folks at IBM to allow you to take a notebook file, tag it, and then expose the same exact notebook, but now as a dashboard where you only present to the user specific plots, specific control, specific interactions, and you hide all of the details that were sort of implementation details, but you still have access to the same file underneath, so that if there's any updates that need to be made, all you have to do is go back and edit the same file that you had on your notebook. Um, and because these files can be converted, multiple authors have used them to, write, to create basically executable books, books that you can buy in print, that you can uh, kind of buy from Amazon, but that also are accessible as a collection of live executable documents. Um, the notebook 
this web app is itself reusable, and so projects like Binder, which was already mentioned here at the conference, allow you to take a GitHub repo that has notebooks, they package it into a Docker container, and they give you basically a ready-to-go executable URL. So that if you have a repo full of notebooks and you define the dependencies for that code to execute, Binder will compile that into a Docker container and give you a URL that you can click on or pass on to your colleagues to log in live into that notebook without having to install anything. You literally get, get a live URL, and Jeremy Freeman and his lab, he's a neuroscientist at Genelia Farm, um, out, of the, out of his grants, basically, he keeps a pool of, a pool of engines on Google Compute Engine uh, available, uh, available for, for this to run. Um, uh, Andrew Ottawan, uh, on the first day of the conference, already mentioned Oriole, so I won't belabor the point, but this is, again, the idea of reusing these components now in the context of delivering, for example, uh, these live annotated video tutorials that contain executable content, but not, not in the normal web app, but instead deployed within, in this case, O'Reilly's own web infrastructure. And this idea has been adopted by other companies. Uh, Microsoft, for example, has Ju uh, Jupyter Notebooks on Azure. If you go to notebooks.azure.com, that gives you notebooks on the Microsoft infrastructure. Google has a similar idea on the Google Cloud Data Lab. IBM has their Data Science Workbe Workbench. And Continuum, who's here uh, uh, at, the, at the conference, has their own cl uh, cloud-hosted Anaconda, um, Anaconda environment. So these are all companies that are basically taking this and adding, their, obviously, their own features and their own tools uh, and their own resources to um, on top of this basic component that they can use. Now, we also have uh, multi-user uh, capabilities uh, so that you're not, you don't only have to run this in your own laptop. Uh, you can also deploy it uh, using, uh, using a tool called Jupyter Hub that now takes this basic building block and wraps around it uh, very highly flexible and configurable uh, multi-user deployment. So, for example, at UC Berkeley, there's a new, there's a new edu big educational initiative in data science. The, the textbook is called Inferential uh, Foundations of Data Science, Computational and Inferential Thinking. And that textbook, which is up on Gitbooks, um, when you click on, on the lessons, you'll see these blue buttons that say interact. If you click on those blue buttons, you get taken to a page where if you're a Berkeley student, you can type in your Berkeley credentials and you're automatically in a live, in a live hosted version uh, of the textbook, and this is being used to teach to, teach to, to um, incoming, uh, incoming freshmen right now. It's been very popular. Um, if you don't have Berkeley credentials, you do get the option to just download it and run it locally. It's, it's all open source. Um, and that is now the foundational course for a big program um, that Berkeley uh, is running in, in data science education, which has a lot of connect what they call connector courses, uh, which are courses that basically build on top of this one and then now take those basic ideas into the direction that is of interest to the students. If you're a very CS person, there's an algorithms course. If you're more of a math and stats person, there's a probability theory course, but there's also courses on data and the mind, on data and ethics, on genomics, on development issues. So it's, a, it's really a fascinating program. Um, and the same exact Jupyter Hub instance, if we go up the hill at Berkeley, uh, instead of being uh, used to deploy, uh, to deploy access to educational materials for freshmen, it's, uh, it's used to, access, to provide access to the, some of the nation's biggest supercomputers um, uh, that the Department of Energy runs so that you have an, a live interactive interface with R and Python um, and Plotly, which they, uh, which they use, and, and all, of the, all of the tools that we've been looking at, but accessing big, big, big iron sort of massive, uh, massive supercomputers. And so it's this idea of providing enough, enough flexibility in the little Lego blocks so that each team can assemble them with the right spawning, with the right credentials, with the right authentication mechanisms to access the resources that need, they need, whether it's lightweight Docker containers for freshman, uh, for freshman data science or humongous supercomputers uh, for scientists. And the notebook itself is evolving. So when I say the notebook, the notebook that may, uh, most of you, if you use it, have installed, you are thinking of something like this. But if you look a little bit more closely, you also have a file manager. You can also open a terminal emulator. It turns out there's a, there's a text editor in there. There's actually a process manager to let you know what you're running. There's even a cluster manager. So the notebook is kind of a misnomer. So what we've done is recently we've restructured, and there, was already some, uh, there were already some illustrations of this, we've restructured the, uh, the interface into a new project that we call Jupyter Lab that is already in sort of pre-alpha release um, if you want to pip install it. Uh, and if you're uh, kind of a, a developer, I would encourage you to begin looking at it and tell us what works and what doesn't. And Jupyter Lab is a reimagination that of, of the system 
after taking the lessons that we've learned in the last few years to help you assemble those pieces in a much more flexible way with clean APIs to connect them all. This is the effort of a lot of people. Uh, I only have the picture of Jason Grout here because Jason is in the room uh, and he's one of the, the, uh, the lead developers, but, but he wanted me to emphasize that, <laughs> that this is the credit here goes to a, a big team of people. I, I just put Jason's uh, picture up because, uh, because he's here. Um, and so with that, I'm going to spend the, the last few minutes that I have doing exactly what you shouldn't do, which is lots of live demos, but lots of people have been doing them, and so far it hasn't been too bad, so uh, let's see, how's the size for that? That's not too bad. So at first, I want to start showing the fact that, yes, indeed, this works with other languages. So even though I am very much a Python person, and today is kind of, by and large, Python day, you can use this to write. So this is an example of a pure R notebook. Uh, up there, it says that the kernel is in R. And when I run this code, this is, if I execute this, this runs in R. Um, and I will get a plot. Uh, and in this case, it's a plot loop plot. Um, but I also have, I can also run standard ggplot uh, calls and use, uh, and use ggplot together in the same document. If I save this document, all of the same tools that I told you about, um, they, uh, they, they all apply. And so, uh, and so I, uh, the, the idea that these, that these tools can be used with other kernels um, is hopefully one that, 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 that is well illustrated here. Now, if I switch to a Python kernel, this is the IPython kernel. Let's see how, how's that doing for size. Well, it's, it's reasonably readable. So this is, this is what JupyterLab looks like. JupyterLab looks like, uh, gives us the file manager uh, that we had before, but it's now here on the side. I can have, I can actually open a new notebook. It asks me what kernel I want to use, and I get a new notebook. The file format of the notebooks is the exact same as before. So that's one thing we are not doing. As we introduce a new UI, we're not breaking your file formats. The underlying files on disk, the underlying communications protocol is exactly the same, which means as we're making the transition, if there's a problem with this, you save the file, you reopen it in the standard notebook, and nothing changes, OK? Because we're not messing with your files. We're being very careful about that. Um, now, uh, I want to illustrate a couple of things about, in this case, the IPython kernel, um, which is that even when you're working in Python, you can actually mix and match other languages. So this is an example of starting uh, to write a little bit of code in Python, but saying, hey, maybe I want to use Julia because I like, I like Julia's uh, uh, syntax or I like its library. So I can load the Julia support in Python, and now I can type Julia code. Though in this case, this Julia code is actually calling NumPy itself. So it's doing mixed computations, and Julia and Python actually are operating in shared memory. So you can allocate the data in one, in one language and operate in it, uh, on, on the data in the other language and mix and match. Um, I'm creating a matplotlib figure within Julia. Uh, but then this figure, which is called fig, I can then grab that fig variable from Julia and pass it on to Python and finish annotating it in Python. So these guys are cooperating in memory. Um, then I can continue working and say, I want to create some data in Python. But now I want to, in this case, a, a simple, a simple uh, pair, of, uh, pair of arrays. And let's say that I remember the, the linear modeling syntax uh, better in, Pi in R than I do in Python, or I like the way, um, the way R provides these very neat summaries for linear fits. So I can say, please. Give me, do a, si a simple linear, um, linear regression on x and y, but when you're done, please give me the results of the fit, the fit coefficients, give them back to me as a Python variable. So this block of code will call R, and this executes in R, and now when I'm done, I get the fit coefficients back to Python, and I can continue. And these are all in the same process. So now I have Python, which is accessing both a Julia runtime and a Python runtime, and sharing data with them simultaneously. Now if I want to speed some code up, uh, maybe I want to speed up some Python here, I can, I can call Cython, and then I can declare this block of code is going to be in Cython instead, and now this will get compiled into Cython. Cython will tell me what it did. It actually gives me a very nice HTML report where the yellow were the, yellow were the line, the more C was auto-generated. So if you see a very yellow line, that's kind of a hot spot for optimization. You can click on it and see exactly what Cython did. Cython is a tool that takes Python code and auto-generates C code. Um, and then you can time the differences and see the performance improvements. And this is at the same time. We haven't changed processes. So now the Cython runtime is linking these things dynamically uh, into the same process. And if you're in scientific computing, it turns out that Fortran still matters. So it turns out Fortran is a scripting language. Uh, and Fortran is a very nice scripting language. So you can say, I want to run this Fortran code. And now I want to plot. And I'm plotting Fortran. And if I change, oh, maybe this was x cubed instead. Uh, well, let's change that to x cubed. 
rerun it and recompile it, and now Fortran is a scripting language. And obviously the old scripting languages, Bash and Perl and Ruby and those guys, they're all, they're all there. So the point is to show that it's a way of bringing all these tools together into one roof so that you can use them, um, so that you can use them uh, comfortably and conveniently. And while you're doing that, you may want to have here your terminal where, uh, oops, caps lock. You may want to hear, have here your terminal where you're monitoring your processes, but you can put this, this thing here on the side so that you can keep working, um, you can keep working here. Uh, and that's the point of having an interface like this so that whether you're working on your laptop or accessing a remote supercomputer, all of your tools are in one place. Um, I want to illustrate now, I think I need to rerun this because I just, So this is an example. This is an example of editing an image, simply loading an image and writing a very simple function that modifies the that convolves it with a Gaussian uh, and modifies the R and G and B channels. And so if I simply say I want to interact with this little image editor, uh, now I get sliders that allow me to modify either the convolution or the R, the red, green, and blue channels. But because, as, we, as, I say, as I keep saying, these are little building blocks, I can say, okay, I actually, while I'm working, I would, I would like to have my, uh, my view over here. And if you notice, as I modify this, these are actually talking to the same underlying model, right? So these are just views on the page, and these sliders are calling back into the kernel. So this is not only client-side, it's a coupling with a with the same protocol between the client side and the kernel. So this could be running whatever arbitrarily complex computation back in a supercomputer uh, with a slider. And if this works, and we'll see if it does. Yep. So we can now hook up, because these are just event handlers, we can hook these things up to a little game controller. So this is just an Xbox controller. Uh, and so I can play. It's kind of awkward to play with four sliders at the same time. But you can see that once you get the hang of it, it becomes very easy to basically have access to explore very rapidly a parameter space. And this took one line, I mean, one line of code to load the interactive thing and just 10 lines of code to hook up the event handlers. And now you have, you have, you have a, a game controller to access uh, parametric data. Um, so moving on from that, uh, I want to show that in the, as I said, we have a text editor uh, that we've had for a long time. We can bring that into, uh, so this is uh, into JupyterLab. We have the same markdown text editor, uh, but now I can say show me that markdown file, also rendered, so that I can see now as I'm working, I can see my markdown, my markdown file uh, live rendered, and as I edit it, um, the live, uh, the live, uh, it updates live. But I can also say, oh, I would like to attach a console that executes, uh, that, that lets me execute code so that as I'm writing code in here, I still want to see it. So, with my cursor, it's kind of small here. Um, so if I type code in here, now I actually, even though I am only writing, uh, writing Markdown, I can still attach kernels uh, using the same protocols to execute code. And again, while I'm working, all of these outputs can be put elsewhere so that I can keep store saving my plots and putting them so that this workspace is completely composable. All of these things are using the exact same uh, um, protocols I was talking about, in addition to having client-side APIs for you to connect, uh, to connect all of these things together. And uh, because this system is designed precisely for this kind of extensibility, you can, we can use it for things even at the level of just looking at data. So traditionally, if you had a CSV file, you could either load it, uh, you, would look at some, you would be looking at something like this, or you might, if you wanted to have a nicer view of it, you could open a notebook and say, load this into a pandas data frame and show it to me. But now we can simply have, where's my CSV file? If I simply click on that CSV file, we have a CSV viewer, which is just the pro proper table view of that, of that file. Or you could have, for example, a JSON file, which is, they're typically not the most pleasant thing to look at. Uh, nice format for a machine, but not particularly friendly. This is GeoJSON data of the locations of museums uh, in, the, in Washington, DC. And if instead I click on it, I preloaded this because I didn't trust the Wi-Fi, so I preloaded it. But uh, this is, um, 
This is the same JSON file now loaded into, into a little, uh, little OpenStreetMap viewer that loads the, 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 the relevant map tiles and, uh, and highlights the locations of these guys. And the point is that these are just plugins that use the same protocols. So this is what JupyterLab actually looks like. It's just, this is the main loader for JupyterLab, and it's just loading a collection of plugins. And so the point is, these are the base plugins that we ship. You can write others. So the, the one that does mapping, for example, is not built in. This is just a teeny extension where I said pip install JupyterLab GeoJSON, and now my JupyterLab learns about how to display GeoJSON files. So this is what I wanted to show, that what we're trying to do is really give you those little toys for you to build other tools with it, for you to extend, for you to develop new environments. You can customize this to death. You can add and remove and turn JupyterLab into whatever you need and, add and build your own tools that use all of our underlying protocols to solve the problems that, uh, that you may have. And with that, and I think like 10 seconds left on the clock, I will stop. Thank you very much.